Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Laura Fortman. I'm the commissioner of the Maine Department of Labor and want to thank you for joining us this morning. I'm joined here by my colleague. Good morning, I'm Kim Smith. I'm the deputy commissioner. And uh, in the room with us, we have uh, Jess Picard and Isaac Jingris, and they will help uh, us uh, facilitate this morning's um, briefing and conversation. As we've done in the past, uh, you can use the chat feature to put in questions. We will also leave time for folks who are joining us by phone to, to ask uh, questions and answer those. Or um, when we get through the uh, briefing, if uh, people would prefer to just ask their questions, they can do it that way as well. So um, we will go through some numbers the same way that we did last week to just kind of give you a top line overview of where we're at and the uh, things that we're seeing. And then we've received some questions. We again have tried to group them into um, themes so that we can try to address uh, as many of those as possible. And then again, uh, there is the chat feature, so feel free to enter questions into uh, using that method and we'll try to get those as well. So the themes that we've heard about this week are fraud, federal programs, um, the staffing and hiring, where we're at and what the update is, uh, and then a whole group around um, processing claims and how does that work and um, some fairly nitty gritty questions about um, some of the um, like stakeholder issues that that uh, that you've been asking as legislators, um, and then a couple of questions about specific programs such as WorkShare, and then just some general questions. Um, so I think that's kind of the the overview of the kinds of questions that. Um, that we've heard. So as you're thinking about this, as I'm going through the issues, if there are other things, please feel free to put those in the, the chat um, box and we'll, we'll try to answer those as quickly as possible. Um, I think at this point I'd like to just put up, and I apologize to the folks on the phone, um, we can make these slides available afterward and um, but uh, I just thought it might be easier for those of you who are accessing this using your computer to just put some information up on the screen and walk through it. So if you're on the phone, um, the top line is really the initial claims data. Um, <clears throat> so it, these numbers are numbers that you should be familiar with. We start with uh, the week of January 27th, where we had roughly 881 initial claims. We saw the dramatic spike that you are all uh, very familiar with. Uh, the week of March 16th, where we jumped to 21,000 claims, it peaked um, the week of um, about on March 30th at 30,910 initial claims. And then we started seeing a gradual reduction in the initial claims. Um, it was 13,000, roughly 500, down to 11,000. We started seeing things start trending down, but leveling off to a little bit under 5,000 claims the week of May 18th and then saw an enormous spike again up to 16,667 initial claims, 11,151 initial claims. And that was that mid-May timeframe where we uh, were hit with fraud. So at that point in time, our efforts had to shift to start examining what was going on with potentially fraudulent claims, what systems did we need to have in place to deal with that? Um, how we put together the task force uh, with our state and federal uh, law enforcement partners to begin addressing that. And then had to put in place um, some filters and flags to try to um, stop any fraudulent claims from going out, as well as um, trying to expedite 
uh, validating claims from legitimate people um, who desperately needed the resources and we wanted to get that, um, that those benefits to them as quickly as possible. So constantly trying to balance those two things. How do you get money out as quickly as possible to people who are eligible and desperately need these resources and at the same time, make sure that we are doing our due diligence to not be paying um, money to criminals. Um, so this past week, we received about um, a little bit under 3,000 initial claims. Um, so we're holding steady at about that 3,000 initial claims each week, which I know sounds like significantly less and for those of us here, we're thinking this is a good sign. At the same time, that is still about three times more uh, claims than we would normally be seeing, uh, probably four times more than we would normally be seeing this time of year. So it's still a significant uh, number of claims. Um, it means that the total number of initial claims that we've seen from mid-March is uh, 165,000 initial claims. Um, and uh, we've um, been processing those at about that same pace that we were talking about last week of about 82.5%. Um, the total amount that has been paid out since about March 16th is $957 million. Uh, which again points to the important role that unemployment insurance plays as both an individual um, uh, lifeline um, when people have lost their job through no fault of their own, as well as a stabilizer for the community, um, because these um, dollars are immediately put back. I mean, all of you are way too familiar with this. You've heard the heartbreaking stories from people who are using their benefits to pay um, their rent or mortgage or their for food for their families. So this is money uh, that folks desperately need. Um, we have been working uh, to look at um, what are the claims that are not processed and what are the steps that we can be taking to expedite those claims. Um, the first thing we uh, needed to do was to really see what categories do these unprocessed claims fall into. And they fall into, um, we've divided them into kind of three different buckets. And uh, I think, Jess, if you could go to the next slide, we have two slides this week. Um, it might be easier to look at this. So the three buckets that we are, um, have identified as claims falling into are claims that are in process where the Department of Labor has, um, like the ball is in our court. Uh, the information is there and we need to figure out how to move through those as quickly as possible. So the steps that we're taking to do that are accelerating our fact findings um, through a couple of things. One is uh, we're looking at are there process improvements we could be making in the fact-finding process itself. So we're analyzing that. Um, as I talked to you uh, about last week, uh, we now have the 24 law students on board. Uh, they have gone through training and we are maximizing um, the time that we have with us to um, do some of the initial work that our experienced and freeing up our experienced adjudicators for more complex tasks. And we are also hiring permanent staff at the same time. Uh, so we've got kind of a two track system going there. Um, we are continuing to uh, work on weekends. Um, and uh, even though tomorrow is a state um, holiday, uh, we will have our unemployment staff uh, working here, although we will not be answering phones, um, to clear, to, to stay focused on some of the tasks that we can perform. 
Um, and uh, one of the things that we are looking at is that um, fact-finding piece. So giving us some time to try out some things and really map out uh, some of the processes and to automate um, some of the work that we're doing. The next bucket of, um, of claims are really, uh, and this is a place where you can help us, is there are a large number of people who filled out a, either an initial claim and never sent in a weekly certification or just started the process of filling out the claim and never finished it. And we're seeing um, significant numbers of people who fall into that particular bucket. And what we have been doing, um, starting, I believe, Kim, three uh, weeks so ago? The weekly emails have been yeah. going out for about a month. So we've been sending these folks um, emails, encouraging them to fill out forms, to um, complete the weekly certification. Uh, just about every single thing we do, we try to encourage people to fill out the weekly certification. It seems like there are still people who, um, because they've never had to apply for unemployment insurance before, uh, they are not aware that, um, that, that the weekly certifications are really the mechanism that triggers the payment of the benefits. Uh, and so moving forward, in addition to the weekly email reminders, we will be sending um, paper uh, 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 letters through the U.S. Postal Service uh, with um, instructions on how to submit weekly certifications. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we are continuing to try to post things on social media, doing press releases, talking to you, uh, reaching out to worker advocate groups, um, to try to um, make sure that people understand this particular step. The third group of um, claims that are waiting are claims that have been flagged as potentially fraudulent. So these are not claims that we have just gone ahead and canceled because we have uh, a very high uh, certainty that these are fraudulent. There's another bucket that um, triggers some of the uh, filters that we have and that they are potentially fraudulent. Um, we um, are sending letters to those folks today um, to uh, encourage them uh, you know, to provide the appropriate documentation to us so that we can verify if they are in fact um, legitimate claimants. And we've also done uh, some updates. We're constantly working with our colleagues from across the country, as well as law enforcement, to refine and tweak the, the filters that we're using both so that we can respond to changes from the fraudsters, as well as to make sure that we are not um, having our system um, stop too many claims that uh, the kind of like the false positives, um, that we're, we're not uh, delaying payment to too many people who are in fact um, legitimate recipients. So Kim, I don't know if you wanted to add anything on what we're doing with fraud because we've made some changes this week. Sure, sure. So coinciding with those letters going out in today's mail, we have added a, an upload tool to our Reemploy Me website. So if you look at the, if you look at the Reemploy Me login page, uh, right above where claimants would log in uh, to their account, there is a link that now says to upload identity verification documents. And um, an individual can click on that link, they'll enter their social security number and then be presented with options to upload their identification. Um, we put up the, the secure email. Um, it was a quick way to address the immediate issue, but as the commissioner said, always looking to improve our process uh, and therefore we have this upload link now available to folks. And we will continue to use our colleagues over at uh, Corrections, Corrections yep. to help us do the ID. Uh, validation and in fact it, it is through um, their hard work and cooperation that we have been able to uh, validate 
um, thousands of um, people and get benefits back out to them as quickly as possible. Uh, we had worked through the backlog last week mm -hmm. um, and we are uh, not anticipating any sort of significant backlog moving forward, um, even with sending letters out uh, to, to folks and reaching out to them directly. So we feel pretty good about that. So those are the slides. Um, we uh, wanted to talk about fraud, which I think we've done. Um, you know, there's always that balancing act of um, how much information do you provide? How much is going to be used by fraudsters? Um, so sometimes we can't give everyone all of the information that they want because we're trying to balance those two needs. Um, but the letters are going to go to people who have received that 999 date. Um, and we feel pretty confident that by sending information to their home email, um, their home address, their home address, not email, um, that uh, we will in fact be reaching um, main people. Uh, we have received at least one question from a legislator about, so what happens in uh, the case of um, someone who reported ID theft to us? Because that was one of the things that we talked about a few weeks ago, is that we started receiving um, information from either individuals or employers or both saying that someone's identity was being uh, used to file an unemployment insurance claim. Uh, and so the question was, what happens if, you know, back in May, uh, I said my identity had been used inappropriately, and so the department put a block on, um, on that particular social security number, um, but now, three weeks, four weeks later, you know, unfortunately, I am uh, unemployed, am I still going to be able to receive unemployment insurance? And the answer is yes, um, that uh, we would still, that person is definitely still eligible for unemployment insurance, but unfortunately, it is going to require a conversation with that person, and we are going to have to have the um, identification provided to us um, because the system uh, has in place a um, mechanism to keep us from paying out on that particular claim. Um, we are in the process of, again, refining it and retooling it, um, but at this moment in time, it is going to require intervention by, um, by speaking to an actual claims representative. I don't know if there's anything else on that that we need to go over. I just wanted to add, we uh, issued a press release earlier today. Uh, we have received 26,000 reports of um, identity imposter fraud, uh, and we have reinstated about 11,000 uh, individuals who were, who were flagged as potentially fraudulent. And we continue to receive um, reports from our federal partners uh, in particular, the uh, U.S. Department of Labor, Office of Inspector General, and we are cooperating with them, uh, as are states across the country. Again, this is not a main specific uh, issue. It is one that is hitting departments of labor across the country, and uh, which is why it's so important for us to work cooperatively um, with our colleagues as well as with law enforcement because they're able to identify uh, certain patterns and we are better able to respond to them. Um, so federal programs, uh, one of the programs that we did roll out this week is the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation. And I know many of you have been asking uh, questions about that. So Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation is a program for people who have exhausted all of their state unemployment um, insurance benefits. And this is, um, this is now one of the things we had done a few weeks ago, because again, 
our goal was always to try to get benefits to people as quickly as possible. Uh, and so people who were exhausting benefits, uh, we started seeing um, a few weeks ago and we rolled them, uh, enrolled them in the pandemic unemployment assistance program so that we could continue to pay benefits to them. Now that we have the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation program available, if they were in PUA, we will move them into PEUC and they will not need to take additional action. Right, other than to keep filing their weekly certification, right. And again, um, and so when we, when we move people into the PEUC program, there are a few questions that we need to ask them to complete their enrollment in the PEUC program. And I know, Commissioner, you have the, the questions in, in front of you. Right, so the questions are, um, you know, they need to uh, attest that they have exhausted their state regular unemployment benefits, that they have no rights to unemployment insurance compensation from any other state, they have to certify that they are not receiving compensation under unemployment compensation, under the unemployment compensation law of Canada, and that they are able and available to work. And we need to be able to provide um, that documentation uh, to our federal partners if we are asked as part of um, the audit. So again, the PEUC program uh, the dates that it's available. This is one of the three special federal unemployment insurance programs that was part of the CARES Act package. This program runs from the week of April 4th, 2020 through the end of December, 2020. Um, so just so you have that kind of uh, framework. And then there are some specifics because this group of people, we talked about the folks who are already enrolled, um, but there are also some individuals who may be eligible for this program who um, uh, will see an increase in their benefits. And those are the, the first group of people that- yes. yep. Um, so the P PUA, the Pandemic Unemployment, and the PEUC, the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment, different programs, slightly different criteria. So people's weekly benefit amount will change, may change, not everybody will. It may change once we roll them into the PEUC program. So this week we have rolled over anybody whose weekly benefit stays the same or will go up. And anyone who is newly exhausted, they will, they will go immediately from state UI into the PEUC program. So they would have received an email from us earlier this week. Um, and when they file their weekly claim this weekend, they will be asked those on a one-time basis, those questions that the commissioner just read off. There are also the, the folks who will see a decrease in their weekly benefit amount. We will be rolling them in the, the next few days. Uh, we will be reaching out, sending them an email as well. And um, the other thing that I wanted to add, as the commissioner said, um, the, the PEUC provided 13 additional weeks from April 4th through the end of this calendar year. So any of the weeks that we paid an individual for PUA will be reduced or be counted towards those 13 weeks. So it won't be 13 weeks on top of what they already received for PUA. If we paid them five weeks of PUA, they will get eight more weeks of PEUC. Right, and there were about 1,200 people who were shifted into that program this week. And then again, just as a reminder, under the PUA, the, um, the weekly benefit amount that people were receiving was $172. And under um, PEUC, it will mirror the state weekly benefit amount. Um, and so the state weekly benefit amount prior to June 1st was $445 a week, the maximum. Um, but some people were receiving, you know, s lower. Um, I think the lowest was about 77 to 70, 77. 77. 77. And then after June 1st, uh, the maximum weekly benefit went up to about, I think it's 462. 462. So, so again, that just gives you some idea of 
if somebody has been on PUA and they were receiving the 172 and they should have been receiving um, anything up to the maximum weekly benefit, uh, they will begin receiving the maximum weekly benefit and there will be retroactive payments to make them whole for the weeks that they were on PUA. And just to talk a little bit about the maximum benefit, um, the commissioner mentioned it was before June 1st and after June 1st, and that's when someone filed their initial application, their initial claim for benefits. So folks that filed March up through May 31st, their maximum weekly benefit is the 445. Anyone who newly applied after June 1st would have the 462 maximum benefit, and that's um, set in law. Yeah. Yeah, every June it gets uh, recalculated, and it's based on the um, the uh, weekly earnings in the state of Maine. So that's the calculation that's done. It's a percentage of the weekly earnings at that time. Okay, so there's a question about, what about pool claims? And I think there's a question in the chat box uh, as well about um, what happens, uh, what are we doing around PUA that appear to be stuck? So I think that this gets back to the, the grouping of um, people that we talked about at the beginning. We are going through all of the, um, all of the claims that we have and then trying to, um, not trying to, pretty much identifying what are the challenges that um, people are, are seeing and then what are the fixes that we can put in place either as a system fix or what are the cases that are truly unique to an individual and require an individual solution. Every single one of these cases is heart-wrenching. Um, everyone here understands that we have, again, uh, a month um, where, you know, it's July 1st and people have rent or mortgage payments that are due or car payments that are due. We are aware of that um, and are doing everything that is humanly possible to try to um, expedite these claims, whether it's a, uh, a, a fix that can be made to the the actual processing system, or it's a fix that can be made to how we do the process. Um, and uh, the challenge is that unemployment insurance, the regular state unemployment insurance, in order to be eligible for it, you have to have lost your job through no fault of your own. You must be able to work, you must be available for work, and you must be actively seeking work. And so the way that the system is designed is to um, be able to automate as much of that decision-making as possible so that you can process um, claims quickly. What happened with the pandemic is that Congress created these three new unemployment insurance programs that, that recognized that there were going to be a whole lot of people who were not going to meet the traditional requirements, and yet were going to be desperately in need. And so many of the um, appropriate filters under normal times cause people who are now newly uh, eligible under these federal programs to, um, to be captured in it. We are, while I do want to say that we have um, paid out benefits to, I'm trying to remember, over uh, 120,000 people. So I do want to say that there are at least 120,000 um, individuals in Maine who have been able to be processed through the unemployment system and are receiving benefits. And the system has to varying degrees, I mean, it's worked for them in the sense that they are able to receive benefits. Um, there are a group of people that are, um, as you said, stuck, and those folks are our priority, and that's one of the reasons that we are all working tomorrow to try to um, expedite some of those system fixes so that um, we can get those hardest to reach folks um, and get them, 
get them benefits as quickly as possible. Okay. We are moving groups of people every week, maybe sometimes multiple times a week, but the groups are getting smaller because the issues are getting more specific. Uh, and earlier this week, we, we moved um, people into the PUA program to get their benefits moving. This particular issue was, um, there was conflicting information on their initial application. We have two separate questions that ask an individual if they're out of work related to COVID-19. Uh, and in this particular case, the grouping was, they answered yes to one and no to the other. So they have been on hold uh, because they were not eligible for state unemployment. And because there was a no, we hadn't yet rolled them into the PUA application. We decided this week to go ahead and just move them into the PUA program. Uh, so that's, that's uh, so the groups are getting smaller um, and we are figuring out what is the, the unique underlying issue that's holding them up. But again, as, um, as the deputy commissioner pointed out, um, one of the things is also that in order to be eligible for pandemic unemployment assistance or the uh, extended benefits, any of the new federal programs, the underlying cause of the unemployment must be related to COVID-19. So um, it's not everyone who is out of work who will necessarily be eligible, although I know it does seem like I mean, the intent was to try to pull in as many people as possible, but there are some folks who may not, if they're, if they're unemployed and it has nothing to do with COVID-19 and they are not eligible for state unemployment, there may be people who fall into that crack. Um, and every week when someone fills out their um, weekly um, certification, they are attesting um, they're swearing that the reason that they are unemployed is because of one of those COVID-19 um, reasons. Um, the uh, U.S. Department of Labor early on had, as they were rolling out guidance, had reminded all of us uh, that they will be doing random audits and that we are also responsible for randomly auditing um, uh, participants um, and, um, and that the information provided on these forms um, must be accurate. So I know people take it very seriously when they're filling these out and that may have been in part what happened with some folks where they weren't answering the questions um, consistently, they, perhaps they didn't understand the questions, um, but answering these questions accurately is, is really important. Um, and, uh, and the federal programs, they must be COVID related in order to be eligible. So um, the, we also received a question because there is one of those federal programs and I even saw in today's Portland Press Herald that they, there was a little confusion about this program. I, I think sometimes people um, lump in the $600 into the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program it's separate from that. Pandemic unemployment assistance is available for folks through December of 2020. The $600 is the federal pandemic unemployment compensation. And it's the $600 that is added on top of any pandemic unemployment assistance um, program or um, the state unemployment um, assistance program. So it's an on top of, it's not a standalone program. So the, uh, that particular federal pandemic unemployment compensation program expires the week of July 25th, unless Congress takes some sort of action. But the underlying unemployment insurance program um, continues if it's uh, pandemic unemployment assistance through December or state unemployment assistance, as long as someone is eligible for that, they're eligible for up to 26 weeks of benefits. So anything about that? Was that so Not on that, well? but I know we have a question, a couple of PUA questions. Okay, so let's... Um, so in, we are, there's a constituent who's been waiting for PUA for weeks. How will this person know uh, that they are in the queue? If you're filing your weekly certifications, we will get to you. Um, the, the group that we, we don't, it's really in their court is the folks that have not filed a weekly certification. 
Um, so as long as you're filing your weekly certs, um, please know we will get to you. Um, we have another question about an individual who's receiving PUA but uh, restarted their business and um, wondering if, uh, how, how does that work? So basically, um, this would be, I guess, considered partial unemployment mm -hmm. and any income and expenses, if this is a self-employed individual, should be reported on the weekly certification. And I know we've received a couple of questions about that uh, as far as how is, what should be reported on the weekly certification. So folks for, who are self-employed, we're asking them to report their net income under the, the odd jobs question. And so net income is if you take a look at Schedule C for the IRS, you take your income, convert that to a weekly basis, take the expenses that are listed on that Schedule C, convert those to a weekly basis, and then whatever the net is would be what's reported. Um, and the question is, have you earned any income through odd jobs? And so the, the secondary question there is, what if after taking my income and my expenses, I have a negative? So then the answer to be, answer to question five, odd jobs would be no, you did not earn any income. So um, I, I think there were some questions about, and this didn't exactly get to it, but um, uh, it, it was about the, um, I know many of you have sent us specifically questions or concerns about constituents, um, and that has gone through the, uh, we started a process about a month ago, and I want to say that there, we've dealt with about 700 um, individual constituent issues through that process. The, there are a couple of things that would be really helpful moving forward. Um, one is um, we're starting, again, these are thorny issues. The folks who are waiting at this point, um, for the most part, it's not a simple, um, you know, help somebody walk somebody through how to fill out an initial claim. These are um, individual situations or challenges that, that they're experiencing or that maybe um, they're bumping up against. Um, they were disqualified from regular UI and now uh, are having trouble um, accessing pandemic unemployment assistance. But one of the things that we've, we really need help with um, is if you could make sure that the names that you're giving us are the actual legal name of the person. Um, because recently we've had a couple of cases where, um, where people have a, a name that they're known by to their friends, um, but that's not the name of the, the legal name in the, uh, in the, um, in the system. Um, and we would have wage data or social security information. We, we just need to make sure it all lines up. And, um, and the, the more information we have up front that's accurate, the more quickly we can process process these claims. Uh, the other thing, and uh, you know, all of us do this, you know, we don't like picking up the phone um, when we don't um, recognize the number, um, but we are trying to call people and we're calling back and we're trying to, um, to connect with folks. Um, so if people are getting a phone call from us, um, you know, please encourage them to, you know, to, to pick up the phone. Um, or to, you know, we've been trying to say, we'll try to call back at such and such a time. Um, but we do realize that um, we're running into increasing difficulty connecting with folks as well. Um, so another big question, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, at least I was trying to, was fact finding. You know, we have, um, said uh, before that unemployment insurance is really, it's a federal state partnership and it's also an employer employee relationship. Um, and so in cases around uh, separation, uh, you know, um, we may have to have conversations with the employer and the employee. Um, there are certain things that automatically trigger fact finding where we need to gather additional information before we can make a decision. We recognized that, um, that 
fact finding was taking way too long. Uh, and so we released a number of claims about six weeks ago uh, for remuneration. We still held the fact findings, but we were paying benefits. Um, we are still scheduling those fact findings to reconcile um, the amounts. Uh, we believe we got, you know, most people probably did not receive more than two weeks of some sort of benefit or pay, which is what we held back. Um, we do need to work through all of those. We're using the law students to try to expedite that process. And we're also, as I said, tomorrow going to be looking at some uh, system, um, exploring some system options to see if we can uh, speed the process up. Uh, we believe that we will be able to do that. Um, and next week I can give you an update on that. But uh, we were, we recognize that the fact findings are taking too long. We also know that the law requires us to go through certain steps and we want to make sure that people um, receive both their due process and um, that things are expedited. Uh, so again, that's the, that's the balance that we're trying to achieve. Um, and we're hoping that uh, as we're using these law students, that we will be able to free up some slots and perhaps plug people in sooner. Uh, I believe that the law requires us to give people a five day notification. Um, and if we're calling people and we haven't given them that notification, we recognize they do not need to talk to us that day. Um, but we're, we're trying to, um, if we can talk to somebody and we can clear it up, um, we, we will do that, uh, um, again, as quickly as possible. Uh, so I think the, uh, there's a question about, um, what order are we trying to work cases in? Uh, we're trying to work things from oldest, meaning, um, oldest in terms of when they applied not necessarily when we heard about it. So, um, so, you know, somebody may call us today and say that they applied, you know, May 15th. Um, and then five minutes later, we may find out that somebody, uh, you know, um, tried applying two weeks ago, we would work on the person from May 15th. Um, in terms of a prioritization, it's not 100% um, clear that we can handle it that way, but that's our intent. The other thing that we try to do is we try to identify are there certain themes or issues that groups of people are having, and if we could fix something for a group of people, that would be a higher priority than um, necessarily for for an individual, but it's a constant prioritization as well as looking at the skill sets of the, of the staff we have who are available to handle um, the particular um, claims or, or issue, but that's pretty much what we do. Um, we did also have a question on staffing since, yep. since you mentioned that. We do have uh, 26 new eligibility agents who will be starting on July 13th. We're currently interviewing for team leaders um, who are the, the, the first line supervisors in the, the call centers. Um, we have 10 accounting technicians starting on July 20th. Um, and accounting technicians, those are folks who mostly work in the tax section and on employer accounts. And we are currently interviewing for claims adjudicators um, and we are anticipating they will start on July 27th. This getting through the interviews this week and making offers. Yeah, and all of those folks need to um, go through training. And right. yeah, so uh, we're also looking at what kind of training can be offered, um, how can we adapt, because we still are uh, performing a lot of the functions using telework um, for, for staff as well. So. Uh, again, trying to make sure that people are safe um, and, uh, and at the same time are able to perform their jobs. Uh, so we're doing all of those things. So 
I know we have about 15 minutes left. Maybe we can switch over and, and take some questions. Sure. Um, I know US Bank question. Yeah, I know there's a, a question about the, the delays that we've had the last two weeks on um, you know, the Tuesday payments. Normally folks that file on a Sunday and a Monday will receive their benefit payment on a Tuesday. And we've had issues um, Again, because most people are filing on those days, um, the, the volume of, of the volume of the files that we're putting out are are large. I know last week it was an issue with the the job that it took to run those um, processes just ran late, uh, and and this week I we received a notification from our bank that there was an issue. I don't have information on what that was. I know they had um, resolved that issue before the start of the business day, but depending on the length of time it takes an individual to get there from our bank to their bank, it, it could have been a 24 hour delay. Some folks may still have gotten their, their benefits on Tuesday, just later in the day. Mm -hmm. And the way that uh, the bank is selected is through an RFP process, correct? Yes, we are required to submit uh, requests for proposals for um, any, any large contracts. This certainly is a large contract. And I, it's been several years US, since US Bank has been the unemployment, um, they operate our debit card program as well as they are the state's financial institution. So any of our direct deposits also go through US Bank. Uh, question about, can we describe what occurs when a legislator attests to an individual's identity? Um, we, when you attest to it, we take your word for it and we process that claim. So. Uh, how will people be asked to answer the questions to move into PUC program? It will be helpful for us to let people know what to look out for. So when people are moved over to the PEUC program, um, their next weekly certification, so the, again, about 1,200 people that we moved this week, when they file on Sunday or later, they will receive the questions that the commissioner read off earlier, and uh, it will just come up as before their, their normal weekly certification questions, I guess, if you will. They'll be asked those questions and then they'll be moved into the, the normal questions and then that's it, then it's the same process going forward. Right, so it's on their account. It's not something that's right. gonna be sent to them. It's when they go in to do their weekly certification, that's what's gonna pop up right. on their screen. <clears throat> okay, when is MDOL requesting tax documents from self-employed? So uh, we have been focused on the PEUC program. Um, we are also focused on trying to refine those small groups of um, folks that haven't rolled to PUA, for instance, or who are not receiving their benefits. Uh, we're still testing the, the tax upload, I mean, the income verification process, but that should be coming in the, the next couple of weeks. And not everyone will be asked to do that. We are working to, um, uh, with one of our uh, state partners to access some information so that hopefully we will not need to have everyone provide that information if we're able to access that um, elsewhere we will. Um, we anticipate that about somewhere about 50 yep. 50 percent of the people will need to be providing tax documentation to us and we will let them know <clears throat> who they are. Um, so again, please make sure that we have accurate information on file, um, you know, particularly uh, your email, constituents email address. There's a question about the folks who have been having a hard time um, getting through and getting their weekly certifications paid. Um, if they happen to go past the July 25th date, will they still get the extra $600? And yes, absolutely, we will pay that retroactively. Uh, Yeah, what number are staff calling from? So it's not a, it's not a, it's yeah, not it's, the same will, number. It, it could, depending on the, the telephone system or depending on their cellular carrier, it could come up as an unknown caller. It could come up as the 800 number. It could come up um, as a general number. It's unfortunately, that is the problem that we can't tell them to look for this particular number. Yeah. Right, if we come up with some way of doing that, we would be happy to. Um, 
Okay, uh, questions continue to have problems about figure out net self-employment, income minus expenses. Is the result negative? So I, think I think you I answered, answered that. that. Yep. Should self-employed people who are working but not earning So they reopen their business, they're working, but they are not earning an income because their expenses are greater. I'm assuming that's what the question is. But not earning that income, do they have to report that they've returned to work? So self-employed individuals are going to answer the question about odd jobs um, because the question about that is, have you worked for an employer? They have not worked for another employer. They're, they're working for themselves. Um, so they would answer, no, they have not earned income from an odd job. Assuming, assuming it's a negative. If they do, even if it's $100, they need to report the $100 right. for that week. Okay, hearing frustration with the WorkShare program, is that functioning and what advice do you have for employers, employees who aren't seeing payments there? So <clears throat> the WorkShare program was designed as a layoff aversion program, and it was also designed um, to have kind of consistent um, hours. So the intent is um, you're facing some sort of an economic crisis. And I know that as, a, as, as a, an owner of a business that I'm going to need to reduce my, um, my expenditures by a certain amount rather than having to lay off um, a group of people. WorkShare allows you to reduce the um, hours that people are working in either a division or across your entire workforce. So that was the intent. Um, there's a requirement that you have a plan that's filed, worked on with the Department of Labor and that you consistently stick to those hours. Um, it's being used now in a creative way, which is good, um, to help bring people back to work. I think because Prior to the pandemic, we had about three employers in the whole state who were using this, and we are now up over 175 employers. Um, that uh, some uh, that it's um, that people may not have fully understood uh, all of the um, nuances of using the program. So, for example, if I say, "Okay, everybody is going to work 30 hours a week." but my business fluctuates and maybe I only need people 25 hours this week and then next week I need people 35 hours. If I'm making weekly changes like that, um, it, this program may not be the best fit for that particular employer. Um, also, the employer needs to provide weekly documentation and each of the employees also needs to fill out forms. If there's any inconsistency between the information that the employer provides and the information that any of the employees provide, it will impact their ability to receive benefits. So it may impact Kim differently than it impacts me. Um, we are working, one, we've staffed up that um, group of people who are working on WorkShare because we think it is a good fit. For the, for the businesses where it's a good business fit, it's a great opportunity, but it is not for everyone. Um, but we do think that it can be better used um, and we are staffing up that, that unit of people who are working on it and we're expanding it from our Bureau of Empl Unemployment Compensation folks to include our Bureau of Employment Services team. So many of you have probably worked with our rapid response folks um, in the Bureau of Employment Services, and so that team will be expanded to include them as well. Um, the, we're encouraging anyone, the point of contact um, for WorkShare should be the HR director who has, or whoever in the company has developed the plan, um, and, um, and the staff people here. Um, we're setting it up as an account model so that there will be uh, individual employees will have responsibility for specific employers and that one point of contact should smooth out um, 
any, uh, or not any, but many of the challenges that people are seeing. Uh, and so, so when, in, when the workers have a problem with their work share claim, we recommend that they go to their HR office and then so that the HR staff can work with our staff. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question about self-employed individuals who are receiving the $172 a week for PUA and when we do a redetermination um, that potentially increases that, do we then redetermine their eligibility on a weekly basis? Um, because we know many folks were probably denied weeks of benefits because their earnings were greater than the $172, but it may not be less than the $445, for instance. Mm -hmm. And yes, we will um, do a redetermination on each of the weeks that have been filed. Uh, we'll make any payments that become eligible because of the new, the new level, and they would receive the extra $600 up through the week ending July 25th. So again, this is a question about self-employed and if they're working but they haven't earned money, uh, should they say that they've returned to work or not? Uh, let me check on that one. I, yeah, I don't we, know. We if will find out the answer to that. One. I don't know if it would trigger something, but um, okay. I don't know if there. I can't tell if there are more I think questions. That's the, I think we have that the one on the the self-employed and returning to work. We will get back to that one. So, is there anything beyond that, Jess? Okay. Does anybody on the phone have a question? If let me get people in. It <clears throat> if there are no uh, questions. I think as we're looking forward to next uh, next week, I'm um, looking forward to uh, you know updating you on the progress that we're making, and in particular things like fact finding. And we should be um, able to also update you on the self-employed yes. uh, next week as well. Um, as always, thank you for uh, you know reaching out to us for all of the work that you're doing. Um, you know, we do read everything that you're sending to us. I know sometimes it can feel like things are going into a black hole, but um, they, really, they really aren't. Um, we do pay close attention to what you're experiencing and seeing, and uh, again, trying to, um, trying to identify if there are system changes, fixes, streamlining that we can be doing. Um, it has been, um, we know that people are hurting um, and we are doing everything that we can to make sure that we get benefits out into the hands of people who desperately need them as quickly as possible. So, so thank you. <laughs>